Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Rancher Mirage Public Library. My name is David Bryant. I'm the library director, and I'm going to say this as factually and flat as possible. Two things. I paid for this honorarium for Penny Riven. That is not why I say that. It's to say that it's so important that we get those private funds to help virtually all of our programming. These shows are free, and this is not a show. This is a graduate level mini course in two days by an absolutely brilliant presenter who has been a broadcaster from the Middle East. She has been a writer on the Middle East. She speaks Arabic. And she's one of my personal heroes. And when you hear her, you'll know why she will become one of your heroes as well. In my humble opinion, there is no more important topic today than radical Islam and terror. Penny Riven will keep you posted. Thank you, Penny, and thank you all for coming. Well, I want to thank David Bryan and the Rancho Mirage Library for inviting me to come. I want to thank the city of Rancho Mirage, and I want to thank you for coming. Many of you have come to a lot of my talks, and this is a very high-level discussion of the topics that I address, and uh, often they're very serious topics. So thanks for staying as interested as you are, and I appreciate it very much. And I'll be here tomorrow. This is a two-part lecture series. I'm talking about terrorism the roots, and the legacy. Today we're going to talk about the roots, starting way back in the 7th century. And then tomorrow I want to talk about modern terrorism, the legacy of the roots that we're going to talk about today. And I think we need to expand our thinking about Islam, because we think of it mostly as a religion, which it is, but Islam is much more. Islam is a political system and was, from the beginning, a military organization. And it's been so for almost 1,500 years. And this long shadow of Muhammad, the messenger or the prophet in Islam, stretches across the centuries and comes right down to the present. We know Muhammad the prophet. We know Muhammad the messenger. But there's another side to the story. Muhammad, the great military fighter, the warrior. From the beginning, Muhammad governed the state, he led the religion, and he was the greatest warrior in Islam's battle to convert the world to Islam. Now, we Americans, for the most part, get our information from the media. We, after all, we have all-you-can-eat restaurants 24-7, and now we have all-you-can-absorb newscasts 24-7. And we have breaking news all the time that isn't exactly breaking, and it's rarely news. And by definition, breaking news is devoid of context. And a viewer could go mad because we're overwhelmed by all the crises minute after minute, day after day, over and over. And another thing, the government does not work at the same speed the media does. So often we feel we're caught in a time warp. We don't know what's going on. So I want to try to give you some frameworks by which you can address and assess topics and subjects on your own. And I like to start with two quotes from Winston Churchill because we're bombarded with so much information, and we really are now that these campaigns are underway. Winston Churchill said, you will never reach your destination if you stop and throw stones at every dog that barks. And Churchill also said, success is the ability to go from one failure to another with no loss of enthusiasm. That's the one we might have to work on. Well, here's what I'm going to talk about this afternoon to you. Muhammad the warrior, the history of his rise in power, his military innovations, and his mission then and now. 
Mohammed was from the beginning a fierce warrior for the faith. Think of Mohammed, I caution you, and many of you have heard me speak before. I want you to think of Mohammed not as a Jesus figure. Think of Mohammed rather as George Washington, the Pope, and General George Patton all rolled into one. Mohammed created the means and the circumstances to transform very fragmented Arab tribes and Arab clans into a unique, huge militia with a definite Muslim identity. Historically, Mohammed was the world's most successful religious leader because Mohammed com uh, completed his mission during his lifetime. But none of this would have been possible had Mohammed not been a superb warrior. So I thought I'll introduce here right now a little cheat sheet to bring you up to speed on some of the things I'm going to talk about. Many of you have attended classes that I've taught or been to lectures and you sort of know this, but you might like a refresher. Others of you aren't really clear on this, so let me just lay out the parameters. Islam is the religion. The Muslims are the people who practice the religion. About 1.6 billion people in the world today are Muslim. That's roughly about the same amount as Roman Catholics. The total tr Christian population of the world today is 20 billion, but Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world, and it is believed certainly long before the end of the 21st century that the majority of people following a religion on the planet will be Muslim. I think there's something else you need to be aware of. The word Islam in Arabic means submission. The word Islam does not mean peace. Salem in, in Arabic means peace, Salem. And the word is Salem. Salem is buried in the word Islam. But you get the peace from Islam once you have submitted. So Islam is a religion of submission. Submission to the word of God, sub, as interpreted by Muslims, and submission to the Quran. Muslims believe Muhammad was the last messenger, the last prophet from God. And the Arabic word for God is Allah, Allah, the God. Now, Muslims don't believe, nor do they teach, that Muhammad was the only messenger from God. It's just that Muhammad is the final messenger, the last messenger for the world's only true faith. The Quran, Al Quran, is the holy book in Islam. The Quran is to Muslims what Jesus Christ is to Christians. Muhammad was born in the year 570 of the Common Era, 570 AD. He was born in Mecca in Arabia, today Saudi Arabia. Muhammad, when he's 40 years old, gets the call, from, Muslims believe Muhammad, when he's 40 years old, gets the call from the angel Gabriel in the year 610 of the Common Era. Muhammad preaches around the city of Mecca. He doesn't have a lot of success. The people in Mecca, the city leaders, are very hostile toward Muhammad, and they threaten him. So in the year 622, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> in the year 622, when Muhammad is 52 years old, he leaves Mecca and he goes to Medina, another city. And the year 622 is such an important year for Muslims that it becomes the year one on the Muslim calendar. So 1.6 billion people used the year 622 of the Common Era as their year one. In reality, on the Muslim calendar, it's really about the year 1456 because it's a lunar calendar, 28 days, and so it floats. Um, so you really can't subtract 622 from 2016 and come up with the exact date. On the other hand, this is way more complicated than we're going to get, but on the other hand, the Iranians, the Persians, use a solar calendar, same as ours, so you can subtract 622 from 2016 and come up with the right date. But um, for our purposes, 622 is a very important date in Islamic history, and it becomes the year one on the Islamic calendar. It's known as the Hijra, leaving one place and going to another. And this religion, Islam, really takes off in Medina, really takes off. 
They make a lot of converts. There are battles starting, many battles, I guess you would say. And Muhammad here in Mecca, in Medina, has a base. And he develops an army of fanatical followers. There are lots of battles and lots of victories for Islam. In 632, 10 years later, when Muhammad is about 62 years old, Muhammad dies. Now the problem is Muhammad has no designated successor, no khalifa, khalifa, caliph. And a very small group of these early, early converts to Islam want only a blood relative of Muhammad to lead the Muslim community. Muhammad had no sons. The only male relative Muhammad had was a cousin, a male cousin, Ali. And Ali was also Muhammad's son-in-law. He was married to one of Muhammad's daughters. So this small group call themselves the party of Ali. They want Ali in as the first caliph or khalifa. And they are known as the Shia or the Shiites, the party of Ali. And they promote Ali to be the first caliph, the first successor to Muhammad. A vote is held and Ali loses to a man named Abu Bakr. Because when Muhammad dies, a lot of these early converts take off. Their loyalty was really to Muhammad, not to the faith. And they went back to their tribes. And so this early group of converts said, we got to hang on to this core. And Abu Bakr is about 62 years old. He's elected the first caliph, Khalifa. He goes out after the fallen away Muslims, brings them back and hangs on to the core of Islam. He serves as caliph only two years. And it's no accident today that a lot of leaders in, the, in these various jihadi groups take the name Abu Bakr, a man who writes a book I'm gonna talk about tomorrow, The Management of Savagery, takes the name um, Abu Bakr Naji. The leader of ISIS today is known as, he took the name Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. So to Muslims, this means a lot. Sometimes in the West, it goes right over the heads. People don't realize the significance these names have. So Abu Bakr dies, an election is held. Again, the party of Ali, the Shiites push Ali forward, at least let him be the second caliph. He loses, Omar is elected the second caliph. Omar serves as caliph for about 10 years. He's murdered. A third election is held. Ali is pushed forward. He loses. The Shiites lose. Uthman is elected as the third caliph. He serves as caliph about 11 years. He's murdered. And on the fourth election for a caliph or a khalifa, a successor to Muhammad, the Shiites really promote Ali, and Ali is elected as the fourth rightly guided caliphs. These are known as the four rightly guided caliphs in Islam. Like Christian children or Christians know Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Muslims know Abu Bakr, Omar, Uthman, and Ali. So on the fourth election, Ali is elected as the fourth caliph. And these four caliphs, the rightly guided caliphs, are the early caliphs in Islam. But the Shiites do not recognize the first three as legitimate. Because Abu Bakr, Omar, and Uthman were not blood relatives of Muhammad. The Sunnis, the majority in Islam, they don't think a caliph or a successor to Muhammad or a leader of the Muslim community necessarily has to be a blood relative. For Sunnis, whomever's elected to lead the Muslim community is okay because God is directing the community and if it weren't okay, God wouldn't allow it to happen. If the caliph happens to be a blood relative, no problem, but it doesn't have to be a blood relative for the Sunnis. There are more Shiites today than there were in the past, but the Sunni Muslims are still the majority. In fact, Iran is the only official Shiite country in the world today, and the Iranians are Persians, not Arabs. Iranians are not Semitic people like Jews and Arabs. The Iranians use the Persians use the same writing system, the same alphabet, Arabic, as the Arabs do, but their language is different, it's Farsi. And so the Persians are very different than the Arabs. The Sunni and the Shiites are always in competition for leadership of the Muslim community. They have been since the establishment of Islam, and we see it today playing out in Yemen between Saudi Arabia and Iran. But the differences between Sunni and Shia are not theological differences. 
The differences between Christians are theological differences. Not all Christians believe the same thing. All Muslims believe the same thing and follow the basic five pillars of Islam. So the main objective for all Muslims, the main objective is to eliminate infidels. All right, let's talk specifically about Muhammad. Muhammad revolutionizes Arab warfare. Muhammad changes tribal armies into instruments of religion capable capable of large-scale combat operations. And for all practical purposes, Muhammad invented what we call today insurgency warfare. And at the extreme end of insurgency warfare is terrorism. After all, Muhammad had been a caravan organizer for at least 25 years before he began his religious mission. And Muhammad was an expert in understanding logistics and planning. And this expertise permits Muhammad to conduct military operations over very long distances across very inhospitable terrains. Under Muhammad's leadership, the old tribal code that limited blood baths among Arabs was abandoned. And Muhammad replaces it with the vendetta. This new community of Muslims made Arab warfare much more encompassing and much bloodier than ever before. Whippings, beheadings, burning, and crucifixions were allowed. Muhammad begins his military mission in 622 in Medina with only about 320 fighters. Eight years later, in 630, Muhammad leads an army of over 20,000 men and he leads them on a 250-mile march across the Arabian Desert. It took nearly 20 days during the hottest summer of that year, and this trek was nothing short of astounding. And Muhammad was a truly distinguished general. In 10 years, he fought eight major battles, led 18 raids, planned another 38 military operations that operated under his strategic direction. Muhammad was a military theorist. He was an organizational reformer. He was a strategic thinker, an operational level combat commander, a political military leader, and above all, a revolutionary. Muhammad's intelligence services, his spies, came to rival that of the Byzantine Christian Empire and Persia, especially when it came to obtaining political information. Because Muhammad believed all war is cunning, all war is deception. And although Muhammad was a shrewd strategist and used force to achieve political goals, Muhammad also perfected non-military methods such as alliance building, political assassinations, bribery, religious appeals, mercy, and calculated butchery when necessary. And it was always to strengthen the position of Islam. Muhammad's belief in Islam and Muhammad's belief in his role as the final, the last messenger of God, revolutionized Arabian warfare and it resulted in the very first army in history motivated by a coherent system of religious beliefs. That Muhammad, in modern terms, led the first national insurgency is a fact not lost on today's jihadis, especially ISIS, who cite the Quran and Muhammad's use of violence as a way to justify their own brutality and viciousness. Muhammad's rise to power is a textbook example of a successful insurgency. Because the basic requirement for any insurgency is a charismatic leader whose followers will follow him anywhere. And insurgencies always need a messianic messiah ideology to replace the existing social, political, economic order that they're going to get rid of. Insurgencies need a new world order. And Muhammad gave it to his followers, saying it was ordained by God himself. 
To accomplish all this, Muhammad creates the Ummah, the Muslim community on earth. Muhammad's revolutionary community consists of the original converts, these are known as the Ansars, or the original converts to Islam are known as helpers. They were the foundation of this early Muslim community. And within this group of helpers was an inner circle of experienced field commanders who provided military expertise. Once Muhammad created this group of revolutionaries, he established a firm base from which to conduct military operations against his enemies. And these attacks often took the form of ambushes and raids. Muhammad chose the city of Medina as his base because Medina was close to the caravan routes coming out of Mecca and through Arabia on their way to Syria, and this was the economic lifeline from the Orient through Arabia up to the Mediterranean. On the other hand, Mohammed knew that conversions and political alliances, not military engagements, were going to be the keys to any long-term successes. And Mohammed may have been the very first commander in history to implement a policy known as the People's War or the People's Army which was later embraced during the Vietnam War by the commanders in North Vietnam. Muhammad firmly established a belief that all Muslims have a responsibility to fight for the faith in whatever way they can. And in view of this objective, Muhammad's application of force and violence was always directed towards strategic goals. Muhammad's troops at, uh, attacked towns, tribes, garrisons, before they could form any hostile coalitions against him. He isolated enemies by severing their economic lifelines. He always disrupted the lines of communication. He laid siege to cities and towns. He introduced psychological warfare. He employed terror and massacre as a means to weaken the will of his enemies. It's important to understand that the teachings of the Quran, more than anything else, permit Muhammad's small revolutionary group to evolve into a huge army capable of very large scale engagements. ISIS, for example, has learned this lesson well, but so did Al Qaeda and some of the others. To illustrate, in 624 at the Battle of Badr, Muhammad could put only about 314 men in the front lines. Two years, Later, at a future battle, over 1,500 Muslims took the field and went to the front lines. By 628, the Muslim army had grown to over 2,000 active combatant, uh, combatants. When Muhammad mounted his assault on Mecca in 630, he had well over 10,000 men. And at another battle a few months later, Muhammad's army was in excess of 12,000 men. So what does all this mean? Well, what's evident from these numbers is that Muhammad's insurgency grew very quickly and was able to recruit foreign, that is, non-Arab military manpower. And like all insurgencies, Muhammad's forces initially got their weapons by taking them off of any prisoners they captured or off of the dead enemy. Weapons such as swords, spears, daggers, helmets, any body armor, these were expensive, and the Muslim converts, mostly poor, could not afford them. In addition, Muhammad established the practice of requiring any prisoner captured by the Muslims to provide weapons and equipment as a ransom instead of money. Muhammad's ability to obtain sufficient weapons and equipment also had an important political advantage. Many of these converts came from the very poorest tribes, and by giving these poor converts expensive military equipment, Muhammad raised their status within their own clans and tribes, and it guaranteed they would be loyal to him, if not always to Islam. But an insurgency has to be able to sustain the civilian base. The people who live in these areas where the fighters live are the ones that support the fighters. And to accomplish this, Muhammad changes the ancient customs about the sharing of any wealth taken in a battle. Before Muhammad came, 
Various Arab leaders took one-fourth of the loot for themselves. Muhammad changes this. Muhammad orders a leader can only take one-fifth of the loot, and he's not taking it for himself, he's taking it for the Muslim community, for the ummah. And most important, Muhammad establishes that the first to get the rewards of any battle were the poor, the widows, and the orphans of the soldiers killed in that battle. Now, Muhammad had enemies, and he was always on guard against an attempt on his life. Like other leaders, Muhammad surrounded himself with very, the core of very loyal followers, and they acted as his bodyguards. And the Sufa, this small group of very loyal followers, always lived in the mosque right next door to Muhammad's home, usually a tent. So they lived in the mosque, Muhammad lived in a tent. They lived right next door to him. Osama bin Laden followed this pattern. These loyal, these very fanatical followers were always recruited from among the most zealous converts. And they always came from the most impoverished tribes. They were devoted to Muhammad, and they served as his bodyguards. They also served as a secret police, and they would gather intelligence, carry out assassinations, and spread terror in the name of the religion. When these loyalists were not fighting, they spent their time memorizing the Quran. Now, no insurgency can survive without a sophisticated intelligence apparatus. Not back then, not now. And as Muhammad's group grew, the intelligence services became much more organized. They used spies, they debriefed prisoners, they had combat patrols, reconnaissance forces. They used all of these as a way to gather intelligence, get information. In addition, Muhammad understood the role of propaganda. He understood it very well. And Muhammad went to great lengths to make his message widely accepted. Because in the largely illiterate Arab society, it's the poet who's the major PR person. So Muhammad hired the very best poets to sing his praises and to degrade his opponents. But terrorism is the vital element of any really successful insurgency, and it was no less so in Muhammad's case. Muhammad's inner circle hunted down any of his enemies and marked them for execution so that when the forces came through later, they knew who to execute. Muhammad uses terrorism in two basic ways. First, he guarantees discipline by making public examples of traitors. The penalty for apostasy, that is leaving the faith, you're a Muslim and you're not practicing properly or you leave the faith, the penalty for apostasy, apostasy was death. Muhammad ordered his political enemies assassinated and this often included poets and singers who publicly ridiculed him. Second, Muhammad used terror and terrorism on a large scale to strike fear into the heart of his enemies. On one occasion in Medina, Muhammad ordered all the Jewish adult males, about 900, beheaded in the city square. Their women and children were sold into slavery and their property was distributed among the Muslim followers. Shortly after Muhammad's conquest of Mecca, Muhammad declared the war of the knife against all those who remain unbelievers. His followers were instructed to kill any infidels they encountered on the spot. And today, ISIS paints or makes a mark on the door of Shiites, Christians, infidels, and Yazidis who were considered infidels marking their homes for death when other ISIS troops come through the area. Remarkably, Muhammad's ruthlessness and this brutality only serves to strengthen his position with opponents and allies alike. Muhammad's use of terrorism 
however, doesn't diminish Islam as a religion. You think it might, but Muhammad's use of terrorism doesn't diminish Islam as a religion because over time, as Islam moves out of the militant period and becomes uh, the Islamic empire with a capital first in Damascus and then Baghdad and eventually with the Turks in Istanbul, this violent past is sort of forgotten and only the faith remains. However, military and religious scholars agree that had Muhammad not brought about a military revolution when he began his ministry, Islam, the religion, would not have survived. And things were shaky after Muhammad's death. Many of these tribes that had sworn allegiance to Islam left the faith. And this leads to the first war after Muhammad's death, the War of the Apostates. Bring back the fallen away. Islam had a solid base, a very solid base after the caliphs were, you get the first four caliphs. In less than 100 years after Muhammad's death, his heirs, the caliphs, had conquered Jerusalem, Cairo, the Persian Empire, and by the 15th century, 1453, after a 55-day siege, the Muslims, under the Turks, who were the majority in the religion by then, conquered the Christian city of Constantinople, and they renamed it Istanbul. And from Istanbul, the sultans, which is the Turkish term, ruled the Islamic world until 1918 and the end of World War I. Muhammad transformed the social composition of the Arab tribes, which had heretofore been a collection of clans loyal only to themselves, into a mighty army loyal only to Islam. In the time before Muhammad, the Bedouins, the camel Arabs, the camel people, and the townspeople had always viewed each other with suspicion. After Muhammad, they saw themselves joined as brother Muslims. Theoretically, within the Muslim community, there's not to be a distinction between the citizen and the soldier. All members of Islam had an obligation to defend the religion and participate in battles. Muslim armies demonstrate a very high degree of military motivation because being a good warrior had always been at the center of Arab values. But Muhammad enhances the warrior status one of Muhammad's most important innovations <clears throat> was that Muhammad convinces his troops that they're doing God's work on earth. No army before Muhammad's had ever placed religion at the center of military motiv uh, motivation. No army before Muhammad had ever defined the soldier's primary act as working as an instrument of God's will. And this ideology of a holy war, a jihad, and martyrdom was later introduced to the Western worlds during the Crusades in the 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th centuries. The result, still evident in Islamic societies today, is that a Muslim soldier has far more respect and a higher social status than soldiers in non-Muslim countries. But this community of Muslims is not a nation state in the modern sense. This Muslim community is a community of religious believers under the command of Muhammad and the Quran and the later caliphs or khalifas. A central element for Muslims then and now is the idea that death is not to be feared. Death is to be embraced. The Quran promises that anyone killed in battle, anyone killed in a jihad, a holy war, will immediately enter paradise and have eternal life. And this remains, remains a very powerful inducement to fight for Allah. Because to die fighting in defense of Islam is to become a martyr and fulfill God's will. Muhammad's military legacy is clearly evident in the modern world of insurgency and in this powerful idea of jihad. For Muhammad, War was never an end in itself. For Muhammad, war was a method, never a goal. The goal for Muslims was and remains 
to spread Islam. And if this gives you pause, allow me to quote the Turkish Prime Minister Erdogan, who said late last year when he was speaking to Admiral James Lyons, retired of the United States Navy, who was in an intelligence briefing, and various people were speaking to the committee, and one of them was the current Prime Minister of Turkey. And the Prime Minister of Turkey said, I think the West doesn't appreciate that there are no modifiers in Islam. Islam is Islam. Today, democracy is the train it is riding to complete its mission. So that should give you pause for thought. Thank you, thank you very much.